Hi, I'm Dr. Dave Wolfthal from the Lakeville Animal Hospital. Uh, we're here today in Ted Williams Park in Lakeville, uh, Massachusetts. It's a beautiful, warm summer's day. Sun is shining, almost no clouds. Got a gorgeous pond behind us. And we're gonna talk a little bit about heartworm disease. In front of me is Troika. Troika is my dog. She is a 10-year-old Welch Corgi. She's the boss of the house, aren't you? Heartworm is spread by mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, of course, need water to breed. Lakeville, obviously with the name, has tons of water, lakes, ponds, streams. We've got gorgeous uh, loon pond behind us. Anyway, heartworm. Heartworm is exactly what it sounds like. These are worms that live and breed in your dog's heart. The only way that a dog can get this is by being bitten by a mosquito. And as I said, with all the ponds, lakes, stagnant water in this area, heartworm is a major, major, major problem. It's also a preventable problem. Okay, so how does your dog get heartworm? Mosquito that has this parasite comes along, bites the dog. This baby heartworm, called a microfilaria, enters the dog's skin, migrates into the bloodstream. Well, these are microscopic, so you can't see them, they're tiny. It takes up to six months for these dogs, dogs, worms, to grow. They grow from microscopic to being anywhere between eight and 14 inches long. These things are huge, figure, out like that. Pencil thin, actually a little thinner than a pencil, but very, very long. Obviously, if you have an organ the size of a heart, let's say the size of my fist, and you have worms eight to 14 inches long inside that organ, we have problems. When the worms, the baby worms enter the body, they're in the bloodstream, and as they grow, they migrate into larger and larger and larger blood vessels until they can reach the point where if you have more than one or two or three, and sometimes we have dozens in a, uh, a body, uh, they can actually occlude blood vessels, they can cause damage to the lining of the heart, they can cause damage to other organs, at least the baby worms can, the microfilaria can. So this is a major problem. Now once these worms are in the body, they mate, they produce hundreds of thousands of new baby worms which circulate in the bloodstream. A mosquito comes along, bites the dog, and then that mosquito can then transmit this to another dog. So what do you do about heartworm disease? First of all, once a year, every dog should have a blood test. We're looking for evidence that the dog has the disease. If they don't have it, if they're negative, the next step is put the patient on some form of heartworm preventive. There are several. Most of these are oral. They're given once a month, every month, all year long. Do not stop. CAPSI, the Council of Parasite Control in the United States, uh, recommends that every patient be tested once a year. Now, it used to be that the medications were given orally and were given daily, not monthly. And these daily medications, while they were quite effective, also had a nasty side effect. If you gave them to a patient that had heartworm disease, uh, what you'd do is you'd cause a massive die-off of these baby worms that were in the body, and it could actually cause an allergic reaction and kill the patient. And not a real good situation there. Nowadays, the preventives are not going to do that. They can make your patient ill if they actually have heartworm disease, but you're not gonna kill them, thank God. So, once a year, you test the patient. If they're negative, they go on heartworm prevention, retest next year, make sure the prevention is working. If man makes it, Man can also mess it up. Nothing man makes works 100% of the time. These preventives are pretty darn close to being foolproof. But again, nothing man makes is foolproof. 
Troika, you look very comfortable down there. Cool. Okay, so your dog is on heartworm preventive. What happens if your dog does get heartworm? Or got heartworm before you got the dog? We see a lot of dogs here that are uh, actually coming up to the New England area from the south. And a lot of these dogs actually do have heartworm. Heartworm is a disastrous problem in the south. All right, the dog comes up, it's been tested, it's been shown to have heartworm. Is this a treatable disease? Yes, it is a treatable disease, but it's not an easy treatment. The first thing that you need to do is determine if the dog can tolerate treatment and does the dog have these circulating baby worms? One thing we've learned in the last dozen years to 15 years is a lot of dogs are positive. They have the adult worms, but they don't have the baby worms. Variety of reasons for that, too long to go into right now. All right, well, if they are tested positive, first thing your doctor is going to want to do is get a blood screen, make sure we don't have any liver or kidney damage that will have an effect on treatment. Make sure that we don't have any major heart damage. A lot of these dogs come in, they have no signs of disease whatsoever. Some of these dogs come in and they're coughing or hacking or wheezing or they have exercise intolerance or their appetite is just not all that great. Uh, some dogs come in in acute collapse. These dogs are in deep, deep, deep trouble. This is a major, major, major problem. All right, blood test done, chest x-rays. It's the only way you can actually tell how severe is the damage to the heart, to the lungs. If everything looks okay, you'll probably get started on some type of an antibiotic. The most common is doxycycline. And then the next step is to arrange to give medication in the hospital setting, not given at home, to kill the adult worms. This is an injection. It's given in the lower back muscles. You give one injection, and the patient goes home for 30 days. Don't do anything. Rest, relax, no running, no jumping, because what we've started to do is kill off some of these adult worms. Notice we haven't done anything about the baby worms yet. We started to kill off some of these adult worms. What we're doing is we're trading live worms in the heart for dead worms in the heart. These dead worms are going to start to break up and disintegrate. Well, if you have pieces of these worms circulating in the bloodstream, what's going to happen is if the dog is too active, these worms can now go out, these pieces of worms can go out and shower the body like a little blood clot. If they get stuck in something important, that can cause severe, severe side effects. Uh, blood clot anywhere important can cause death if it goes to the brain can cause major problems if it goes to the lungs or the kidneys. So these dogs have to stay quiet for a full 30 days. At the end of 30 days, come back to the hospital. This time they're given two of these injections, one on day one, one on day two, and then they go home again for 30 days. So this is, as you can see, a relatively long process. Again, no running, no jumping, no exercise for a full 30 days, and they come back and now they're given medication to kill the baby worms, the microfilaria. This is relatively easy for most dogs. Uh, they don't tend to have reactions to the, the medication to kill the baby worms. They can have reactions to the medication to kill the adult worms. Uh, the adult worm medication is given in the muscle. They can get severe muscle pain, fever, discomfort. Usually doesn't happen. Side effects are always possible. Medi uh, giving the medication to kill the baby worms, very rarely do they have any side effects at all except possibly throwing up, which is why they stay in the hospital for one day. Okay, we've killed the baby worms. They go home. How do we know we did okay and killed everything? Well, we don't until they come back again and we draw a test looking for the baby worms. If the baby worms are gone, they're on their heartworm prevention, about three months later, we can now go ahead, test them last time. Hopefully everything is gone and they stay on their prevention. Prevention is the key. It's a lot, lot, lot less expensive 
to prevent this disease than it is to treat this disease. Treatment is expensive, as you can see. It can take several months from start to finish. Prevention is either a pill given once a month. I call it a pill, but most of the time nowadays it's a chewable. Uh, my dogs think it's a cookie. They, they can't wait to get it. Um, there's also a topical. In fact, there's several topicals that you can use instead, if, especially if you have dogs that are very finicky about anything that you give them to eat. So that's the scoop on canine heartworm disease. What about feline? What about cats? Cats can get this also. In cats, it's a little different. In cats, this is purely a respiratory problem. Now, obviously, being outdoors, we don't have a cat that we can show you today. Uh, otherwise, we'd have a, a major escapee. Cats get this the same way, bitten by a mosquito, because cats are not normal hosts for this. They don't have the full life cycle. The worms don't develop into adults in cats. In fact, it's very, very, very rare to see an adult worm in a cat. What happens most often is you see the baby worms who have now reached a certain stage in their development, and that's as far as they can go because the cat is an unnatural host. So this causes, instead of heart disease, lung disease. These cats are coughing, hacking, wheezing. Sometimes they end up with respiratory disease. One of the interesting side effects is sometimes the only sign you will see in a cat with heartworm disease is the cat vomits. What does vomiting have to do with heartworm? I don't know, but that is very often one of the only signs that you see. Diagnosis in a cat can be very, very, very tricky. The standard tests don't always work. So what we're looking for in cats is a combination of clinical signs, coughing, hacking, wheezing, throwing up unexpectedly. And then we do what's called an antigen antibody test. Antigen is a protein that's on the surface of the worm. We check for that. Antibody is what your body produces in reaction to being presented with this worm. The worm enters your body. The body says, no, you don't belong here. We're going to fight you off. And it produces antibodies against the worm. So if we've got antigen or antibody, the worm has been present and has been fought off. We have clinical signs. We're coughing, hacking, wheezing. And the last and sometimes the most diagnostic is ultrasound of the heart. On an ultrasound, very often you can see evidence of these worms in not really the heart, but in the major vessels around the heart, in the pulmonary vessels. OK, how do you treat a cat? This is the bad part. You don't. There is no effective treatment to get heartworm out of a cat. Really what you need to do is you treat the cat for the signs. So if I'm coughing, we need to give you medication to decrease your coughing. If you're vomiting, medication to decrease your vomiting. And basically, you keep the cat comfortable until the worm dies. All right, how long do these worms live? Five years in a dog, three years in a cat. Ballpark numbers. These are not super accurate numbers. Uh, how long does a human live? You can't give a definitive number. But the same idea. You have to basically treat these animals to keep them comfortable until that worm or worms passed away. Unfortunately, one of the signs that you very often see in cats is you don't see anything. And I'm not trying to be dramatic but you don't see anything until the cat drops dead. And I've actually had this happen with one of our own staff members a few years ago. Troika, you're going to go off into the corner? Fine. Um, what happens is a gentleman came home, literally found his cat dead in the living room, uh, brought the cat in. We did an autopsy, and we found one baby heartworm in one of the great vessels around the heart. Very, very, very common. All right, the man came home, found the cat dead in the living room. Well, the cat was indoors. Well, if it's an indoor pet, how does it get heartworm? Well, one of my favorite lines, when was the last time you found an outdoor-only mosquito? Mosquitoes do get into the house 
Uh, how many times have you been lying awake and you just can't wait to swat that little buzzing critter that's going around your nose and preventing you from sleeping? Uh, unfortunately, mosquitoes do get in. It is recommended that cats be on heartworm prevention at, uh, as well as dogs. Obviously, because they are not a normal host, they get this disease much less often. So most of the time, a lot of our clients do not do this. Uh, but it is recommended that even indoor cats be on heartworm preventive. That is something you can discuss with your own doctor, of course. If you have a heartworm problem in your area, whatever number of dogs you see with heartworm disease, about 10% of that number you will see in cats. So it's not a common disease in cats, but boy is it nasty. So again, speak to your doctor. Heartworm prevention, once a month, every month, all year long, never, ever, ever stop. Troika's getting comfortable down here on this rocky beach. Test your pet once a year. Cats, speak to your doctor. He may want to start them on heartworm prevention right away. Keep them on it once a year. Even indoor cats should be tested. In fact, in Massachusetts, more indoor cats test positive for heartworm than outdoor cats. Um, outdoor cats, I guess, are on preventive more. This is a disease, by the way, that is everywhere. It is throughout the United States. It used to be a southern problem. Now it's literally all the states. There is a new issue with dogs becoming resistant to some of the heartworm preventives. I guess a better way to describe that, it's not the dog that becomes resistant. Some of the heartworm strains are becoming resistant to the preventives. This is a whole very, very controversial subject. Um, there are medications, or at least one medication that is out there that apparently these strains are not uh, resistant to, so there's at least one medication that's on the market that works on all the strains. We have not yet seen a resistant strain in the Massachusetts area, knock on wood. Uh, this seems to be restricted to the south, Mississippi River Delta, but a couple of cases have shown up in Tennessee, which is not in the Mississippi, uh, on the Mississippi River. Uh, if these dogs continue to come up to New England from the south, guess what? One of these days, we're going to discover a dog that's brought this resistance strain with it, and we are going to have a problem. So again, something to discuss with your doctor. Test your pets once a year, preventive all year long. Never, ever, ever stop. Since we're still here by the water, we were talking about mosquitoes and the heartworm before, let's talk a little bit about having fun in the summertime with your dog in the water. I don't know too many dogs that don't like to swim. Troika here is one. She's not the world's best swimmer. Uh, mainly, she only has three legs. Barkley, my other dog, uh, well, he's blind, so he can't really go into the water by himself. But most dogs love going swimming, playing fetch with a stick. All right, well, is there anything you need to know about keeping track? Troika's going off into the woods here. Sorry about that. Uh, anything you need to know about keeping track of your dog in the water? Okay, everybody thinks of Jaws and the dog disappearing. It's a whole different story. Water is really one of the great things that we've got in this country for recreation, play, just as far as I'm concerned, just put me down by a beach with a book in my hand. I don't even have to go in the water. If your dog goes swimming, one of the things you definitely want to do when you get them home, rinse them off. Uh, there are some pathogens in the water that we don't necessarily want to deal with. We'll talk about that. But definitely don't just let your dog get into the water and then come home and then just leave them like that. Uh, definitely rinse them off. Make sure that the dog is within range that you can go get your dog. Okay? It's just like people. You know, never go swimming by yourself. Keep an eye on them. Uh, most dogs are excellent swimmers, but everybody gets tired, whether you've got two legs or four, so make sure that your dog is within range that you can get them out. Dogs in boats, you see photos of that all the time. Not a problem, but again, life preserver. They do have life jackets, flotation devices. Definitely use them. Dogs in water is just a standard. It's absolutely wonderful. Just make sure you rinse them off. 
One of the things you have to worry about, though, uh, with water, fresh water, not salt water, is leptospirosis. This is a disease, it's a bacterial disease, that dogs, people too, can get from ingesting water that has this bacteria in it. Leptospirosis is a bacteria that's commonly found in rats, mice, fox, skunk, dogs, uh, basically a lot of wildlife, raccoons. It's transmitted by the urine. So one of these critters goes and pees in the lake, or the pond, or the stream, or around here, the cranberry bog. And your dog goes swimming, which of course is a very natural thing for them to do. And then what they'll do is they'll ingest some of this water and pick up this bacteria. The bacteria affects the liver, and the kidneys. Signs can range from, eh, I'm having a bad day, and the next day I'm completely normal. All the way up to on Monday, I'm having a bad day. On Tuesday, I'm really sick. And on Wednesday, I've passed away. So, dog goes swimming, ingests the bacteria, and we end up with a dog that now has got really severe fever, liver disease, kidney disease, one or the other or both, jaundice, they're yellow. These dogs can be really, 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 really sick. And of course, the nasty thing is this can be transmitted to people. There is treatment, but even better, of course, is vaccination. So these dogs who have a lifestyle where they go in water, really we'd recommend vaccinate these dogs for leptospirosis. If they do become ill for any reason, vomiting, diarrhea, the most common things that you see, these dogs should be examined. And of course then uh, treatment should be begun. Remember with leptospirosis, if the dog is sick, you have to treat these guys with gloves on. If they're home and they're being treated and they've had an accident in the house, anything like that, wear gloves when you clean anything up because this can be transmitted to people. I actually have had one client, not only did their dog get sick, the owner got sick. Uh, and again, this can be a nasty, nasty, nasty disease. Uh, what about the dog that doesn't go in the water? Can they still get leptospirosis? Yeah, they can. All lepto needs is moisture. So, can you get it from the rat, the mouse, the raccoon, the fox, the skunk, whatever was on your front lawn and there's condensation in the morning? Yes, it's possible. It's not hugely likely, but it is possible. Again, in this part of Massachusetts, we do not see this often. When we do see it, it's nasty. Let's talk a little bit about other summertime things that can happen. Uh, other than swimming, skunks. Almost every dog owner has had an encounter with a skunk sooner or later. And around here, we see a lot of little wildlife. Uh, and skunk spray is really something that can be nasty. It's not deadly, but it can be very, very, very irritating. Uh, my own experience, dog goes out in a fenced-in backyard. When I say fenced-in, we had a palisade fence it was about five feet high, and this was a black lab, never said a word. Lily went out one night, came back in, and my God, you could have knocked us over with a ping pong ball uh, from the odor that was emanating from her. Obviously, she'd gotten sprayed by a skunk, uh, and she's wagging her tail. She was happy as a clam. She thought this was wonderful. Okay, what do you do when you have a skunk spray? Your best bet is not the old tomato juice thing. It's not a bad thing, but really it, it doesn't work super, super well. Uh, if you use it on, for example, a white poodle, you will have a pink poodle. Not exactly desirable. Your best bet, believe it or not, is a mix of baking soda, dishwashing detergent, and hydrogen peroxide. You want to soak your dog in this mixture. I mean really, really drench them in it, the whole darn dog. Your best bet is to actually let it air dry, get this off them. If they've been sprayed and the collar is impregnated with this, and to tell you the truth, don't bother. Throw the collar out, get another one. Um, this stuff can be surprisingly corrosive. Lily was wearing a metal collar when she got sprayed. 
forget it. The metal collar got thrown out. There's no way you can uh, salvage a lot of this stuff. It's not worth the hassle of trying to salvage a collar. You use your recipe for your skunk spray with your hydrogen peroxide, your baking soda, your dishwashing detergent, and you still have this faint odor of skunk. Guess what? Do it again. And maybe again. It can take a couple of times, but it's far more effective than using any of the commercial mixes. Uh, another thing we should talk about on uh, summertime, heat stroke. Heat stroke is really serious. It's also, for the most part, preventable. The brachiocephalic dogs, the dogs who have really, really, really pushed in faces. I used to call it this much anatomy in this much space. Okay, these are the dogs that are gonna be the most prone. Breathing difficulties, panting, high humidity is gonna be a problem. Think of it as an, a, a human, an elderly patient with cardiac disease. This is uh, not exactly the world's best weather for them either. If it's hot and humid, stay in the cool areas, go out, do your business on a leash, back in the house, try and avoid heavy exertion. This is the exact same stuff that your human physician is going to tell you. If your dog does seem to be uncomfortable, you know, your best bet, if you're unsure, get a rectal thermometer. They are still available. If your dog's temperature is over 103 and is obviously in distress, get that dog to a doctor. That is an emergency. It really is. Uh, 103 hot day, dog is happy. I'm not terribly concerned. But if you've got a dog that's in distress, play safe. Take the dog to the doctor. The treatment is relatively easy if you catch it early. But again, it can be deadly. Cars. Everybody knows about don't leave your child in a hot car on a summer's day. Well, don't leave your pets in a hot car on a summer's day either. The temperature in a car, when the temperature outside is like 90, 95 degrees in high humidity, the temperature in the car, with the, when you turn that air conditioner off, it was 75 degrees in the car. In 20 minutes, that temperature can be 100 degrees and higher. It can go up really, really fast. You will end up with a cooked dog so the standard, of course, is don't leave your dog in the car on a hot day. Even if the windows are cracked, cracking the windows doesn't do very much. That car is going to act like an oven. I have my own personal rule. Uh, very often on my way to the office, I will stop at Dunkin' Donuts, pick up a coffee. Well, the dogs are in the car. When I leave my car, I look at my watch. If I'm in that store for seven minutes and I'm not out of there, I leave. They've just lost the sale. No way is the dog going to stay in the car any longer than that. And that's when I leave that car has had the air conditioner on and it's a nice, cool 70, 72 degrees in there. Within seven minutes, I'm back in that car. My coffee can wait. A mailbag question. Somebody uh, wrote in asking about heartworm preventive. They give their dog heartworm preventive once a month, but it seems like they give the dog the preventive on Monday and on Tuesday, the dog is throwing up. Uh, can a dog have a reaction to heartworm preventive? The answer is sure. Uh, you can have a reaction to pretty much any medication. If you're consistently seeing the same type of a reaction with a particular heartworm preventive, there are many different types. Um, Australian cattle dogs, Australian shepherds, Shelties, Collies, these dogs actually have a genetic problem or a defect where they can't tolerate one of the more common heartworm preventions. Um, these dogs often will just use a different oral medication. What about the dog who you give the oral medication and they still throw up? Or this dog just won't take oral medications. It's a horror show trying to get a pill in or even a chewy that the dog doesn't like. In this case, there are topicals that you can use, and there are several, and they're very, very, very effective. By all means, talk to your doctor. They can make the appropriate recommendation for the appropriate breed, and of course, for uh, the appropriate dog, if it's not a breed issue, but just an I don't want to take my oral pills medic uh, issue. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to call us. Lakeville Animal Hospital, Lakeville, Massachusetts. 
can find our number on the website, uh, lakevilleanimalhospital.com. You can reach us by phone. Our address, all our contact information will be presented. Good to see you. Talk to you again next time.